Welcome everyone um, to uh, Kuretsu uh, Forum Lunch and Learn. This is uh, one of our monthly academies. We try to do about six or seven of these a year because we can always brush up on knowledge and learn new things when it comes to investing. Uh, the landscape is constantly changing and some things stay the same and some things change and become different. And so staying on top of that and keeping our education up is really important. Uh, these investments can be can be very lucrative, uh, but digging into the terms of the deal can be somewhat um, daunting at times on what is the best benefit for both the investor and the entrepreneur because it is a bringing together of both parties when we are uh, doing and uh, signing term sheets and they may be helping to negotiate those. So we brought in uh, two experts today uh, from Carney Law. So Joe Wallen uh, is here. I've known Joe for, I don't know, like, 10 years. Nathan's known Joe longer. Um, Joe has been working with uh, startups for a really long time and has been at multiple different firms but has found a good home at Kearney. And then Daniel here uh, is going is his partner in crime and will be helping uh, to talk about things that we should really look at and understand when looking at term sheets, understanding price grounds, convertible notes, what are the differences in these things, is there terms in here that are um, that we should pay attention to more than others. What does a good term sheet look like? And then how do we how are we able to recoup our investment on the other end? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you two, and yeah. you've got the floor. Okay. So thank, well, thank you, you so much. Round of applause for Joe and Daniel. Yeah, so I'm Joe Wallen, and this is my work with Danny uh, Newman. And uh, just a little background on us. Uh, I started practicing with early stage companies in the mid late 1990s um, so I have uh, been around a while uh, lived through the dot-com thing I lived through the 2008 meltdown we, we have done literally Joe, yes. I ask you to kind of stand maybe at the other end sure. because you are being recorded sure. and I want to be sure that we can capture this sure and hear everything, sure so. but we have we have we have Danny and I and our team and we work as a team there's 10 of us on the team we've done like literally hundreds of Hundreds of convertible note financings and, and fixed price financings, safe financings. We've done a lot of these things. Um, from, from both the perspective of the companies and the angel investor groups and venture capital funds, so we, we see from all angles. Yeah, yeah, and the, the convertible note can be a great uh, mechanism to raise money for early stage companies. It's not uh, always a great mechanism, it might not be the right tool or the right thing to do in a particular circumstance. It kind of depends on what the company is trying to do, how much money it's trying to raise, how much it's already raised, how much it's got commitments to raise. Um, but frequently the convertible note can be a great a great a great place for a company to start its fundraising. So anyway, we've written a put some slides together, we've written some notes. You know, uh, we'll we'll start walking through sort of like how we think about these problems and then hopefully you'll interrupt and we can have a cut conversation about you know, things that you have questions about. We've, you know, I've probably, you know, been asked to answer just about any question you can throw at us. So I recommend you try to you try to hit us with something we haven't heard before. Yeah. This is an easy one. <laughs> okay. Will you make the slides available if it's in your Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. And so I'm not sure like you have to make this thing go this there we go. Okay, so some of this is really basic, but you know, what's the gist of it? What's the point of it? Term sheet, really. And you know, frequently we'll represent companies and they'll be brand new companies and they'll want to raise a couple hundred thousand bucks. And if you're raising a couple hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't make sense from a legal fees perspective or from a documentation perspective to try to sell preferred stock if you're only raising a couple hundred thousand dollars. Because even if you use the series C financing documents, you're probably still going to spend a disproportionate amount of the money you raised on legal fees. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to keep your, you're raising a couple hundred thousand dollars, you want to keep your dollars spent on lawyer fees down to a couple thousand bucks. Yeah. Why is that? Because there should be standards, I thought. In my experience, the legal fees and expenses associated with a Series C preferred round, even a very simple one, they run up to like five, six, seven thousand bucks. Or more. Or more. Or more. Or more. 15, 10, how much? 10. Back and forth. There's because there's a lot more meaty things to negotiate there than at a convertible note round. Where so is it negotiation for time on negotiation? Is that the fact? That yeah, and it, especially with if you go back and forth between company council and investment council, then 
stacks that way part of it. The general rule of thumb, I think the general rule of thumb is, and it, it varies based on which lawyers you ask, but a lot of lawyers would say, hey, unless you're raising at least $750,000, it doesn't make sense to do a preferred stock financing. It's too expensive. Let's put a disproportionate amount of legal fees. I've done preferred stock financing, series C financings, where we raise like half a million bucks. Um, you know, so you can go lower, but if it's $200,000, I think most lawyers are going to tell their companies, hey, do a convertible note or do a safe, do something really simple, keep your legal fees down. Of course, convertible notes are really very simple, right? They're kind of in, they're very intricate documents, and there's lots of places where if you don't understand them, you might you might be you might be fooled. Um, so we were talking about this before everyone wanted in, but a, a note should always contemplate, and, and a term sheet for a note should always contemplate, and we'll send we'll send everyone our standard form convertible note term sheet that we hand out to companies when they're trying to go raise money. But the term sheet and the note should always address the question of, hey, what if the company sold before the note converts? What happens? And in the old days, you know, I, I was, I've been playing this game a long time. You know, I don't see it very often anymore. But in the old days, I would see notes that, that wouldn't contemplate anything special happening on a sale of the company prior to conversion. And certainly the business deal isn't that an angel is going to give a company fifty or hundred thousand dollars and if the company sold prior to conversion, certainly the business deal isn't that the investor is only going to get the principal and interest back. That can't be the economic deal. But sometimes you'll still see notes like this floating. Yeah, I, I mean I, I think Brianna was just telling an example of that that happened recently and the, the investors were sort of flabbergasted surprised by that it's just the sale happened because right. they wanted to share that side of the company just like everyone else. Right, in your perspective as an angel, uh, as an investor, when it's not rounds, if the company does get to a sale before the conversion of the note, your perspective is going to be, well, gee, you probably wouldn't have got there without my money, right? And so I, I need to get something more than just my interest back. And usually the phraseology is that you get the greater of a multiple of your invested amount. Maybe it's 3x, maybe it's 1.75x, it's a negotiated term. Or you get the amount that you would receive had you converted in common stock at the valuation cap immediately prior to the liquidity. Usually the phraseology should get the greater of those two things. So that's something to look out for. Don't want to invest in a note if there's a sale prior to conversion and all you get back is 4% interest or something. That's that's not, it should never happen to an investor. Nor should a lawyer serve up a document which attempts to do that. Nor should a lawyer serve up a document which doesn't contain an attorney's fees clause. I've also seen that. If you're going to have to sue somebody for your money back, it's a pretty bitter pill to swallow if you find out, oh, most notes contain an attorney's fees clause for prevailing parties, but somehow my note didn't. And I have to bear my own fees while I sue this company. That is crappy as well. We talked about this before the meeting, but we can put together if you like. And I think we've already put together in, in a number of different types of forms. We can maybe make one that's appropriate for this group, like a checklist of, hey, what, what are the gotchas? And what are the things you don't want to inadvertently do? Like a really simple thing so you can check your check your terms to make sure they're, they're good terms. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, maybe I'm jumping ahead. So I Go have ahead. to admit, when I first started investing six or seven years ago, convertible note, frankly, I signed a few. I probably never read them. I was only really, and it seems like in this part of the world, a lot of angels don't like convertible notes, so I've been hearing that. So I just recently started actually reading them. So I, I realized, like one I signed a few years ago, that this is a standard term. It says that the note holder's debt is subservient to future debt that the company might take from a bank or another lender. And I'm thinking, why the hell would anyone sign that? Yeah, and that's a pretty common term, and we we frequently include that in our notes. And the reason why we include it is because if a company does want to go get a bank financing, so let's suppose you actually can find a bank to loan you your com a company money today, not that always easy to do, but if you did have a business which could actually get by bank financing, the bank's going to want a security interest, and the bank's going to want to make sure its security interest is first. And so the bank's going to require. I totally understand why the company yeah. would want that. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's if crazy you don't, as an angel to to agree to that. In my opinion. Yeah, you could you could delete it. You could push back on it. Assuming the company will probably give it. If you push back on it, they probably take it out. If the company did go get bank financing, which is kind of a for most companies, I think, not a 
you know, it's pretty, I don't know what percentage likelihood of a company getting bank Yeah, it's at, a, at a super early stage. At a super early stage, it's pretty low percentage likelihood of this happening in the first place. But if you struck that language, all it would mean was that if the company did get a bank to finance the business, the, the, the bank would end up in the company would end up coming back to you and asking you to sign a subordination. And then you would have the choice at that moment to say, well, I'm not going to sign it or I'm going to sign it. <clears throat> Frequently, investors you know, are happy to see a company get some financing from a bank if it becomes available in relatively decent terms. But you know, you could, you could push back on that. That's a term you could push back on. And most companies, I think, would probably relent because it's kind of a kind of a low likelihood scenario. But does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if the company's trying to yeah. pre-wire approvals so that it doesn't have to battle you. Like, say a company did have 25 or 30 verbal note holders, and it had a bank, and the bank said, "We need you, all your note holders to subordinate." It'll make this. Obtaining the subordination signatures a little easier if you've already previously agreed to, to do it. I, I guess my, I understand why the company would want to do that. Yeah. When I hear people like Peter Weiss and others rail against conversion, <coughs> notes, yeah. And the argument is well, because the note holders don't really have any rights downstream, they could easily be screwed over by. PC or some shenanigans with taking out a loan from somebody else. Uh, yeah, and you I, know, it's just. Uh, I'm not sure notes are that bad. I've actually seen, I've actually seen note investors kind of make up like like bandits. And let me let me explain to you how it works. And I've written an example here in the board. So let's say you do a note at the obscenely high valuation cap of eight million dollars. Okay. I know you guys probably don't like that number, but let's just throw it here for fun. Okay. Um, Let's say the company then goes and raises money at a $20 million pre-money valuation. Um, and I've made the really simple cap table here. Two founders, one owns 600,000 shares, one owns 250,000 shares. They have a available option pool of 125,000 shares, then granted options on 25,000 already. So their fully the cap table is a million shares. In most, and for purposes of simplicity, what I've said, okay, we're gonna raise $20 million, $20 million pre-money and we're going to calculate the price per share of $20 million based on the fully delivered cap table, no increase in the option plan under this first scenario. So we're going to have a $20 share price. The no holders are going to get the lesser, typically the lesser, of the discounted price per share. In my discount, my example, I put a 15% discount on here, so that would be, unless I'm really poor math, $17 a share. Yeah. Um, or the cap price. So the question is, how do we determine the cap price? Well, we know the cap's $8 million. But the thing you want to look out for, you want to try to understand, and the term sheet may or may not say anything about this, but the definitive documents have to say something about it, is so what goes into the denominator when you determine the cap rates. So, a number of different schools of thought on this. The way we draft our notes, because we're company counsel for the most part, is we say, oh, when we determine the cap price, what we're going to put in here is all issued and outstanding securities. So just the stuff that's issued and outstanding. We're not going to put in the available pool that's not used. So under our methodology, um, we would determine the price per share at nine dollars and fourteen cents a share. That's a hell of a lot less than twenty dollars a share. You're actually paying less than half of whatever else is paying. This could be a great deal. I've seen deals where nobleers pay like a third of what the investors pay because they negotiated a good deal. Now, getting back to this question, what goes in the denominator? There's there's many different ways to do this. Um, tech stars. If you look at the new Techstars note, the new Techstars note says, not only do you take into account the entire available option pool in the denominator, you're also going to add to the denominator any increases in that pool that are required as a condition of raising this money. So if these investors said, hey, um, we need you to have at least 200,000 shares available in the pool. And so we're going to make you increase the pool by 75,000 shares. That increase would obviously affect this price per share, affect this price per share down. But for purposes of the cap, you're going to get an even lower conversion price. You're going to get $7.44 a share. And these people are paying like, I don't know, 19 or something. Great deal. Y Combinator, in its latest safe, which was just amended, it sort of splits the baby. It says, hey, we're not going to take into account any increases in the price per share or in the, in the, in the option pool required, but we are going to take into account the entire pool that was available when we gave you our money. 
And so they take kind of a near median. But you can see how the prices vary here. And so notes aren't necessarily a bad deal. And I mean, there are circumstances where people can be screwed for sure, but there are also circumstances where this is a pretty nifty little way to get money into a company, hopefully expeditiously without a lot of legal fees, and still preserve an economic deal that people think is a good deal. We're skipping around a lot, but let's just skip yeah. around if it's, if it's helpful. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we, I mean, just so you know, a lot of companies, like I, uh, I make people go out and shop and deal with the term sheet because I don't want to spend any money on definitive legal documents that they can't close it, but they can't get a deal to it. Um, and so sometimes the, you'll ask for the definitive documents, companies won't have them. But, you know, other times, you know, they'll have them, but they just won't be filled out yet because they're trying to wait and determine, hey, what, what is my valuation cap going to be? What is my, what is the final settled terms going to, terms going to be? And so, if you see a term sheet and someone says, oh, I don't have the definitive underlying document yet, I think it would be fair for you all to say, well, understand we're negotiating terms still, but why don't you send me the document that will form the basis of the definitive document, even if it has blanks in it right now, so let me see what we're doing. <laughs> and we're happy to share all our documents with everybody here so that you can see them. Yeah. We're also happy to always give something a quick spin to help you make sure you're not getting ripped off. Um, so practice really varies on, on term sheets in terms of the length and complexity of them. Um, frequently in a note offering, it's a one-page term sheet. Of course, the Series C documents, the open source documents, I think those are probably the most commonly used open source documents for financing, you know, real estate companies in the world. There, that's a one-page term sheet. A lot of times when people do safe offerings, they want to have a term sheet, but just have a safe, which is great. I know you guys love safes. Um, and then, of course, when you get to a Series A offering, that Series A term sheet is going to be a lot longer. Um, just a quick note on binding, not binding term sheets. I mean, most of the time when we set term sheets, they're not even set for signature. They're just set for, you know, sliding across the table at a coffee meeting and saying, hey, here are the terms. You know, are you interested? Um, if you are going to have a binding term sheet, it's only going to be binding in the sense of, like, confidentiality, exclusivity, each party bearing on a fees or some other fee arrangement. Generally speaking, it's still going to say not binding, subject diligence, execution of the documents. And, I've seen terrible things happen when people attempt to enter into binding contracts. And just, it, it's, a, it's a mistake. I wouldn't do it. Uh -huh. uh, logistics question. Any chance you can move that screen? Yeah, I hope yeah, so. Yeah. So anyway, just a quick note on binding, not binding. I'm not a fan of quote unquote binding you know, short summaries of arrangements because then frequently you get into the longer negotiation. You, don't, you can't agree. We have a binding thing which, you know, which sets up a conflict. So. Um, so in your convertible, we just sort of map off here sort of some random things you probably should expect to see in here. Uh, things we've talked about before, you know, the term sheet should tell you what the interest rate's going to be, when the thing comes due. Frequently, companies will not allow any one angel investor to enforce the note in the event that it's past due. Frequently, there's a clause which says, majority of the holders of the notes have to decide to enforce the note. And that's obviously um, not only good for the company, because if you have one disgruntled minority investor, it's also good for the majority investors, because the majority investors don't want to have one disgruntled minority investor starting a lawsuit over a note. Most notes are amenable with a simple majority consent. Um, so these are the sort of things you, you typically look for. You want to know you know, under what conditions you're going to be forced converted. Usually the term sheet should say, hey, when we raise a million bucks in preferred stock financing, with new money, with new money, your auto convert, you know, execute all the preferred stock documents in that financing. That doesn't qualify financing threshold, which, you know, is, is like usually somewhat proportionate to the amount you have raised in that note round. So if the note round is like 500,000 um, bucks, Want the company to raise at least another five hundred thousand bucks in their preferred stock financing later on. Uh, you don't. You wouldn't want the company to set that super low, like, oh, we only need to raise a hundred thousand, and then we're going to auto convert all of your notes. Right, and you want to make sure it's bona fide third-party money, not the CEO and his family, or something like that, or her family. You want to make sure it's a big enough number that's real money coming in that's going to really price the round and and make the whole thing kind of make sense. Um, from an economics point of view. Um, yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll the thought of that is uh, 
a protecting clause for the, the investor. Yep. Um, but um, do you guys see uh, notes that give the investor the option to convert on a lower amount? Yeah, you, well, okay, usually usually there's this qualified financing threshold, right, which, you know, maybe it's a value box or whatever it is. I mean, who knows? And then the question arises, well, what happens if the company raises, you know, $800,000 uh, in a series C financing at a really good price? What happens then? Well, if you're the investor, you're going to want the optional right to convert there. Um, and it should be at your option. Some notes, I think, I think it's pretty common, um, and I think our note includes this too, optional conversion at maturity date in the hands of the investor, though, not the company. Um, that's not an uncommon thing to have, and but um, I don't like, and I don't think most investors accept if they think about it, and so we don't include it in our documents, the idea that the company could force convert somebody out of cap at maturity. I don't think that really flies. And I think most investors, they see that, they say, no way. Maybe my option, sure. But not the company's options. And so we I don't we don't include that in our notes. If we see a note, if we represent an investor, we see that, we strike it. We don't we don't we don't think that's market or good practice. <clears throat> but 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 if you found it's market for the investor to have the optionality. Yeah. Optionality in the event of a non qualified financing or um, the way the maturity date conversion is usually written is, is it says like, hey, within a certain period of time before or after the maturity of the note, the investor has has at the investor's option the right to convert their note into a stock or a mm -hmm. or a share or a series of preferred that you know contains all the typical customer preferred stock provisions like series C preferred. Um, I've got a general question. Yeah. Um, you guys uh, involved many uh, uh, these notes. Yeah. Uh, how many of those cases uh, you are on the uh, higher buyer startup process? Investors. Yeah, our practice shakes out like probably eighty percent company side and like twenty percent investor side. Okay, so the company side still you are paid through the investors' money. Theoretically, the company owes us the money. Frequently, the money comes from the investors that fund the company to pay for it. Right, right, right. 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 So, uh, you know, we're investors here. Yeah. Right. Understood. And uh, always a negotiation. Yep. And um, so. These are more standard um, things in that note, but you know, the small investor like me, you know, not in a position to negotiate. Yeah. Uh, so how how that actually uh, protect us? So one one way? thing you can do is you can you can do a, a side letter, and a lot of people do a side letter, and the side letter just says, "Hey, company, I'm going to buy your note," but if while my note's outstanding, you just sell a note to somebody else with better terms. I get those terms. Oh, okay, I see. The, oh, do, you right. have, do you have do you have a template MFN letter? Yeah, we have an letter. Yeah, we can send you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can send you that. Yeah, I'm just kind of run business cards around here. So yeah, you can okay. template yeah. MFN. By the way, I think a yeah. well I think a well drafted MFN yeah. says basically if you if company right. you know sells notes mm -hmm. for cash you know for cash. Right with better terms. But like sometimes what happens is a company will, sometimes I've seen companies agree to MFNs, and then they come to gets into Techstars, or gets into Y Combinator or something, right. and then these companies are gonna give the company a note, right. and they're gonna get like really favorable terms for that right. note. Right. So, yeah, so and those really should carry over to that, because these, these companies are doing something that are just providing cash for them. they're doing something different. So a well-drafted MFN should carve out like notes issue for strategic, <coughs> something like this. But if you see one, you know, if you're on the angel side, you can probably just draft a broad-based one that would cover that, and then you can demand it later, or, or, or study in the circumstances, just, you know, you can always wave or do something, you know, something else. And then you put a prevailing attorney clause in that too, which is I'm going to argue, I'm going to argue this with you. You you got to pay it. Yeah. Well, I just think like uh, I mean, your note should have a prevailing parties attorneys clause, and the, the MFN side letter will be read in conjunction with the note. Yeah. It should, awesome. it should be all together. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I think that's kind of shabby if somebody serves up a note to you, and then you're looking through it and you're like, there's no attorney's fees clause. I mean, it just doesn't seem standard and right. 
And, and I, you know, like, what we try to do, even though we're company counsel in these situations, we try not to serve up documents which are going to draw a complaint, reasonable complaint. No one wants to waste their time. Yeah. You know, these documents should be well done and really, I mean, negotiated with business terms all you want, but you, sh you shouldn't have to go back and say, oh, you freaked up this. <coughs> you shouldn't have to do that. Well, that's right? a lawyer's form. So. Yeah, you should start with a good form. Yeah, so let's go to the next slide. Sure. Um, so you love these. Again, we talked about this a little bit already. We do have a same term sheet, like a one pager thing. Um, and we, you know, we've sometimes outfitted our clients with these. We, we also tell our clients that, at least in Seattle, these are frequently not desirable. People frequently don't like these in Seattle. Um, they are pretty common in, in the Bay Area. They get thrown around um, so easily in the Bay Area. Right. And, I mean, there's a lot, it's bigger venture capital and angel network, but they just throw like a million, two million. I, I, I did a round up here and there were there was one or two venture funds and then it was co-invested by a Bay Area VC and it was like two and a half million dollars on a safe and super quick diligence and, and all that. But I mean, that's, that's kind of unusual. I will say I like the safe from the perspective of there's like two blanks to fill in the document. I mean, it's pretty simple and expedient to use the same, but I, I, I get the point that like uh, you prefer to be, you know, debt, debt sits on top of equity rather than some unknown amount of equity of some unknown type to be determined later. I mean, that is kind of uncertain. Yeah. So why should an investor like a safe? I mean, because as we see it here in Seattle, yeah. um, is that it transfers even more risk to the investors. Yeah. Uh, which we're already taking on a substantial amount of risk <coughs> by yeah. giving them money. Yeah. So, what, why, understanding that this was born out of accelerators, yeah. was born out of an accelerator to help make cash easy and quick for these companies, yeah. um, why would we look at this to be something that would be a favorable term sheet? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these things. I think, you know, from the investor point of view, maybe the best thing you can say about the safe is that it's expedient. It's expedient. But, but should it be expedient? I mean, the more, I mean, you know, especially like with our process, diligence is critically important. Yeah. And understanding what you're going to, I mean, these are long-term investments that we're making that are going to take, you know, five to seven years if we're lucky. Chances are some of them are more on the ten-year side of things yeah. uh, before we see uh, an exit. Yeah, so, I agree with you. Unless you're just in a screaming hurry, why would you why slow would down? You and why wouldn't you do something a little a little better for you? I agree. I think safes are, you know, they're great for a company in the sense that there's no interest, there's no maturity date. No, nope. it's like an IOU. It is. It is like there's an no IOU. Interest, there's no maturity date, and I think there is a discontinuity. I mean. This idea that a lot of companies, when they take a note from somebody, they'll think of that note investor and say, hey, you know, that guy, that person's an equity investor in my company. But really, that person, you know, might just be a creditor, you know, chasing you a couple years from now for repayment. And so there is a, there is arguably a conflict of, a conflict of sort of, I guess the best argument I've heard against notes is they create an inherent conflict between the investors and the company. But, you know, that's just the nature of any investment. There's going to be a conflict. So I'm not sure that's really probing okay. a probing thing. But I agree with you. I, would, I mean if you don't like safes, don't don't just say just say no. Mm -hmm. Just say no. We like that. We like to be on top of the equity. We, we don't actually like, like we just actually like equity, but we'll, we'll take that. Yeah. Well and by the way, you know, it's it's strange because we've kind of slipped into a certain way of doing things, right? Like yeah. because of whatever things that have transpired over the last twenty years and and experiences we've had. But I mean there's no reason why you couldn't take common stock with the right to convert the common stock into preferred later if you wanted to become an immediate stockholder of the company. There's no reason we can't do that. We do common stock with a side letter right to convert to uh, preferred when it typically raises per. If you want to become a stockholder right away. Um, but this stockholder thing, like, oh, we're not a stockholder. I mean, you might want to become a stockholder right away so you can start your qualified small business stock holding period. Maybe that's a good reason to do it. But people don't like common stock either. No, they don't. You're like, you're like, you're like preferred. <laughs> right. preferred preference. And so notes, notes not bad if you're, if someone's raising a small amount of money. I think what gets trickier is 
um, if the company, say the company is going to raise a million bucks, uh, but it only has like maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars committed, um, I, I mean, does the company just do a no for the couple hundred grand, and then and then it's qualified financing thresholds, five hundred thousand, it just keeps hunting until it can get five hundred thousand dollars at one time, so it can do a series C quicker. I think a lot of companies just wind up doing these pretty big note rounds yeah. without a lot of thought about when they're going to convert and how they're going to get there. And then they wind up just continuing to do note rounds for like multiple numbers of years and yes. they just raise the caps and, 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 then, and, then, and then they being, sell themselves. And, and then, then they're, they're being weighed down by all the debt that they're trudg trudging along with the company. Right, right, right. It can kind of set the company, I think, kind of off on a really <clears> long path. Um, and you do wind up, like we do that, We've done a couple of deals where we sold companies that had never converted their sales, so never converted their debt because they don't got some qualified financing rounds. And the, the, the math, mathematical difficulties calculating exactly how the proceeds were distributed were not. That was a nightmare. We're not that was like a spreadsheet nightmare. Spreadsheet nightmare. <coughs> so, anyway, we talked about valuation caps. And I was just like, Kelsey, and I wrote a blog post about the denominator issue. For like the lighter capital block or something, like I can get sent around if you want. But yeah, think about the denominator, because maybe you maybe the maybe the policy of the currency form should be the tax charge policy. You know, hey, we don't, we get the we get the increase in the pool too in the denominator if there's one. Mm -hmm. I personally think that's overreaching by tech stars. And we had a company go through their program, and I, well, I told the CEO push back. That's not bogus. These guys are already going to get a great deal because they've got a really low valuation cap. And so they're already getting a great deal. Why are they going to get an even better deal? And Techstars rolled over for the company that I represent and pushed back on in that instance. Sorry, there's a question over here. Um, frequently I hear people go almost ballistic over pre-money valuations and valuations in general. And that's when I usually just go, I don't get a, have a clue what you're talking about. And you know, why is it bad? Why is it good? What is it? Right. So since we seem to be on, I see pre-money yeah. up there. You help at all. So, so the valuation cap only comes into play when the the qualified financing happens. So here it was set at eight million, and there and the pre money valuation is twenty million. So, so that's where the interplay comes in, and it it basically the way it works out is, um, I mean, so say this was a ten million dollar valuation cap, a quick way to look at it is you are essentially going to get twice as many shares as the new money investors that are investing in this $20 million valuation. If, you're, if your valuation cap was $5 million, you'd get roughly four times as many shares as these new investors because they're investing in such a higher valuation. Um, yeah, I think, I think the trouble with valuations is one, like you can't really do an assessment of the valuation of these companies, at least not usually. I mean, they're so nascent, so early, that doing a valuation is kind of a contrivance. And so you're making something up. Peter Thiel said, Peter Thiel said the way to think about startup valuations is not, uh, they're not a reflection of the current value of these companies at all. They're a reflection of the discount on the future value of these things. And you know, it's, it's you just kind of, I think what we all do, for investors is we sort of try to stay in a range that we've seen in the community and that we think you know comparable to other <coughs> deals we've done and that feels right but you're still guessing I mean is it a five million dollar cap or a four million dollar cap or a three million cap depends if, it, if the founder just sold his last three companies or her last three companies for a lot of money maybe you're willing to go no cap just to be a part of that person's deal Sometimes it's as simple as that. I want to be part of that person's deal, and I'm willing to invest on whatever terms they can sell to anybody. I'll fill out the safe and send it in. So the cap is, we, we usually require a cap with anybody raising uh, there's a tremendous amount of pushback, at least in the deal screen, if there is no cap. Uh, it's, so if you see here, it's expensive, right? We're, we're, it's expensive at the valuation. So this is an $8 million cap. So they're going for their next round of financing, which is $20 million. And so it helps to protect the investor in terms of what that is going to be versus it being an unknown when it converts at whatever that price if is. They, if they get follow-on financing and they may uh, raise the caps, I mean, one of the things that I've seen in signing some of these uh, notes already is you get a disclosure of the other people who have already invested. So I've signed some of those. 
but I don't ever recall seeing them, the, the prior people investing, having a different cap. Is it generally not disclosed? Well, you can, <clears throat> like a securities law compliance point of view, I think most investors expect that you're going to hopefully raise money at successfully higher valuations. And so a lot of companies will, yeah, they'll start like a two or three million dollar cap, they'll raise a couple hundred grand at two or three million, and yeah. then they'll raise up to five million, <coughs> raise a couple more. Yeah, some more money. And I think that's totally normal and fine. I don't think that's upsetting. Well, no, I think it's fine. I think that what ends up happening, though, is uh, is you, you you don't know what the cap table looks like or what the dilution looks like uh, uh, when they actually finally convert. And so that's why I was wondering, is there ever any way to kind of back calculate that based on the documents that we've already signed, or is it generally not you, you, the information you not laid out? You should definitely ask the company for like a pro forma cap table. Uh, hey, you, using these assumptions, of your Series C preferred financing. I see. Like, so you ask for that separately. It's yeah. generally not documented. Yeah. It's a guess because we're just like we don't know if the company's going to raise money at a twenty million or exactly. ten million or five million. We we have built a tool where you can plug in, <clears> you know, like hey, say we raised you know a million dollars in notes with a fifteen percent discount on a two million dollar cap, and then we did a Series C, you know, you plug it in the crowd. We have created a tool. Yeah, I was just wondering if other investors generally see it. So for example. Uh, one of the Koretsu companies I just invested in, they had a $20 million cap, but for the Koretsu members who did it by a certain date, it was going to be a $19 million cap. Brianna yeah. probably knows which one that is. But uh, uh, I was actually wondering if those kinds of terms uh, are generally seen you know, by the, the investor pool. or Because I, I don't recall ever seeing the caps that... Well, it's a the, guess, though. Yeah, okay. It's a guess, because the company could raise money. It like, could actually go raise the fixed price financing at a $10 million valuation. Yeah, in yeah. which case you would just get a discount and the cap would, wouldn't have any meaning. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, or, or they could raise, uh, if you have an $8 million valuation cap on the notes, and then you raise money in your Series C <clears throat> preferred round at, say, only $5 million, yeah, yeah. It, you're obviously not going to want to convert at higher than what the That's correct. later round is. That's so correct. then you're going to take it at the 15% discount. Yeah, so if, totally. if this price per share over here is like $5 for the new money investors, then you would get a 15% discount yeah, to yeah, that. Totally. So that's like the interplay. But the, you could, I mean, the, the company or you could create like a model and you could basically yeah, yeah, build this and guess But I mean, yeah. yeah. But it's just not done. That that was the thing I was, because I was just wondering, done. it's like, well, was I actually missing some piece of information I should have gotten? Yeah. And I didn't. Yeah, that's most funny. companies, most companies, well, we, we, we created this tool so that founders can understand what happens to them, what diluted impact across successive yeah. rounds of notes. <clears throat> but that's like an internal, like it's more of like education for the founder about what how it's going to look for them yeah. Yeah. under certain circumstances. So, <clears throat> yeah, they don't usually share that. I know. But, but frequently, I mean, we're, we're doing a round where there's, uh, like there's a company right now that we have that there's a bunch of different convertible notes over the last, I don't know, two or three years. They're finally getting their first preferred <coughs> and some of the note holders are saying, hey, well, what percent am I going to get after converting? So, 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 so separately, on the qualified funding event, is there best practice language to determine the qualified funding event? Because we didn't, I don't think, or is that later in the slides? Yeah, we, we, yeah usually the language says the amount. It says that it's, it's going to be new money. It's not going to include the debt. And it's going to be you know, preferred stock financing. Uh, you know, bona fide third party equity finance. So usually it's, I mean, we could send you the, the typical language, but yeah, there's some kind of a model okay. that people regularly but, use. But, but literally, they, you can't just, because uh, a third party might even be uh, the guy's best friend uh, coming in and saying, hey, I'm going to go wipe everybody out for five million bucks. And that's but but if, you put in a, if you put in a million bucks, I mean, what best friend is going to do that? I don't know, if bona fide third party financing above a certain amount, not including the debt? It's maybe it's a question mark whether it's bona fide third party finance or not. But if you invest a million dollar valuation or something, we're putting a million dollars on a really low valuation, you would still get a discount to that. Yeah, yeah. And so you'd still be okay. Yeah, yeah. I just don't, I don't see a lot of people trying to work around that that way. Is it one, is it, is it some of it's one qualified finance? So let's say the, the cap here is, or the, the, uh, yeah, it's the cap of the raise is one million. Qualified money, yeah. and they raise nine hundred thousand, yeah. and then do another one of nine hundred. Yeah, is it not qualified then? That's not qualified. Yeah, okay. that's why you might want that optional conversion language. Yeah. And truth be told, in most companies when trying to raise money, they're calling all their all their they're calling everyone trying to raise money. Yeah. And really, are they trying to cut people out of the deal? Yeah. 
at least yeah. in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the valuation really, Jim, is, is the market sets the value. So just like with real estate, so I mean, companies, when they set their valuation, it needs to be realistic because if it's not, so you're just going to spend it, a really yeah, long so time. It feels <laughs> when somebody like Jim goes, you know. Yeah, well, know, it's because then, it's expensive. It's, it's is, looking at it from the. Is that just say that that's just saying for us here that we don't believe that number is valid? Well, that's I mean, that's his opinion. I know that's my opinion. So, um, and and he, you know, and everyone has their own opinions on what that is, but really, the market determines the price. <coughs> Oh, and what yeah. they're able to go raise at. Because if so a company comes through and they have a, they just have a beta product and they have a $20 million valuation and, you know, they're good luck. Like, right. they're probably not going to raise any capital. Unless they're a serial entrepreneur and he's already had yeah. next Yeah, I mean, they're now, probably right. not going to raise any capital. So <coughs> it's meant to be the market says the price. But when you ask them if it's like a really high valuation and you say, well, how did you get that valuation? Right? That's the follow-up right. question. How did you get there? Sometimes they'll say, well, I know some guy in D.C. and he set the valuation of this market, right? Because they typically invest in this industry. Then you ask well, them, did the ask V.C. invest? Did the company exactly. said no. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, that happened at the last deal street. Exactly. Right. So you have to ask the right questions to understand because the market is variable and perceptions of the market are as well. So that's why she says, like, Jim's opinion. It's so opinion-based because perceptions of the market are different. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, I just want to be clear on something fundamental here. The, yep. the, the valuation cap, um, that's... That's a no concept. Pre, no. pre, pre money. Pre fixed price <laughs> financing. Yeah. Oh, it's pre money, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, yeah, okay. So, um, well, you, okay, you usually when you specify a valuation cap, it's just, it's hardwired in the document, right? So, I mean, when you say pre money or post money, like, uh, I'm not actually sure how to answer the question because it's like you're putting a hard number in the document. And so when, when you know when the thing converts on the cap, you're taking eight million dividing by the, the denominator. I mean, I suppose the eight million. I mean, you could think of it as oh, well, that includes the money I put in, or it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. You're putting a hard number. So, so if your valuation cap's eight million, and your your you know pre money on financing is being valued at seven million. Sure. But you know, let's say it's a five million financing. Okay. With, um, uh, you, you, are, you, are you getting the benefit of that cap? That well, it sounds like in that instance you would get the discount of the price per share rather than the cap price per share. Although it's not always exactly clear. Like if you raised money at like, uh, well, if, if you raise money at seven, your cap was eight, you're going to just get the discount of price per share. I mean, the math would work. That's the way the math would work. Let's say, let's say five. You clearly get the discount of price per share then, and the cap would be not the relevant. Yeah, and the reason why caps came into being is because in the old days, people would write these uncapped notes and they would have in their mind, like the investor would have in their mind, like, hey, I gave that person a grand and, you know, I thought her company was worth a couple million bucks when I gave her that hundred grand and therefore I should get, you know, I should get, I have in their mind a percentage, like, I should get roughly a couple percent of that company, you know, at some point in a couple of years. And then, you know, if the founder manages to raise money at a ridiculous valuation, and instead of getting a two percent, you had kind of in your mind, you get like 0.2, you You're kind of you're kind of pissed off. You're kind of like, man, I got a bad deal. Like she wouldn't have raised that money at that super high valuation without my money to <coughs> get her there, at least in part. So anyway, that's why caps exist. Just to prevent you from just getting kind of stunned, and blown away at some like, ridiculous <laughs> valuation that the founders are going to get in the subsequent round. In any event. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you've all done lots of Series C financings. We do more A. Okay, let's go to A then. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just, so just because, so do you do? Just because it's the stage of companies that we've done. Okay, yeah. And then, I mean, the, the main distinction, they're all preferred stock financings, but is it? It's revenue. They're big enough, yeah. and you want the paper best set of documents. It's, Usually. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the reason why is that the company has more traction. Yeah. The percentage of them dying. Is it just a uh, kind of terminology? Yeah, it's like, like a lot. Of, yeah. It, you could call a series a seed round an A round. You could. Yeah. In the old days, before Series Seed was invented, we called it a light Series A. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in California are doing, pre they call it pre-seed now, right? Yeah. Pre-seed with a safe. 
Yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. nomenclature and jargon. Yeah, and and uh, people like a lot of companies they'll they'll try to raise like a million or a million and a half bucks in a seed because they want to go down the Silicon Valley to a Series A and raise like five million dollars. And there are lots of like lots of uh, funds in Silicon Valley with five million dollar Series A. But truth be told, if you've done a Series A and raised like a million and a half, you could still go do a Series A and raise five million and just retitle all the prior Series A shares to. Could be your series A too. Whatever. It's just, yeah. it's just jargon. It's just jargon. Yeah. And you, people just have different ideas in their head. Because if you if you raise like a really small series A, like uh, five hundred grand or a million bucks, you're like, hey, it's my series B round, and you're gonna raise maybe like one or one point five. People will be like, oh, maybe that company's not really going anywhere. Because a B round would be like 10, 10 yeah. plus million. Yeah. So, so. I've worked for a diligence outside of Forum that was through family office, and they were the company that came through had different tranches within their right. one. So what's the difference between the different tranches with different valuations? Naturally, because they had different milestones that they were trying to reach, but there's specific use of funds within each tranche. Yeah. And that what's the difference between that and uh, breaking it up into Series A and B? Well, and so you might do, yeah, you might do a series, say you does Series C, and you raise a million bucks at like a dollar share. And then you're trying to raise a Series A, but you hadn't been able to get enough commitments to adjust by doing an A, or, but you needed another million bucks, and you were gonna sell it at a higher price per share, because uh, you had any traction, but, so in that instance, maybe you wanna call it a Series C2, the price per share will be higher for the Series C2, and it'll have a liquidation preference per share that's higher, because it's being sold at a higher price, but you could make the Series C2 and Series C otherwise identical, and so in your charter, you could just fold in the Series C2 and pretty easily create that second preferred stock. And that's fine. Lots of companies do Series C one, two, three, four sometimes. Sometimes you wind up with a pretty robust set of like Series C issuances at successfully higher prices. <coughs> same terms, all the same, you know, peri pursuit liquidation preferences sometimes too. Um, but a lot of it's just sort of like perception and nomenclature. And then what happened? Like what just happens to happen? If you need that extra million bucks and someone's willing to write a check and you don't want to call it an A, it's a higher valuation, you can call it a Series C2. But do you have, I guess my interpretation of the question was, okay. if you have somebody that says, I'm going to give you X amount of money, $5 million as a Series A, but I'm not going to give it all to you it all at once. Mm, we I give see. it in tranches. Yeah. So okay. 2 okay. million, you hit this milestone, come back, we have the money ready to go. At the same price, the, the subsequent money will come in at the same price. Different valuations. Okay, so the valuation goes up if they hit the tranches. If you, they hit the tranches. Right. But then they wouldn't have ever completed their round if they didn't hit the tranches. And I don't know. I've heard of that in uh, in um, inside a corporation that maybe does an innovation project where. Um, the company wants to say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna give you guys a budget of a million dollars to go build a prototype. Um, so normally the the one in the old way of doing it, they would say, all right, you gotta we're gonna we're gonna budget a million, but we're actually gonna fund you based on milestones. We we need you to do this, and then we'll release some money. So. To kind of get around all of the, the hassle and the, the bureaucracy, they, it's called metered funding. So they do, uh, they basically say, all right, here's a million dollars, but you have, we're only going to release a hundred thousand dollars in ten spurts as you hit these milestones. All you have to do is show us that the milestone is reached, and then the check is written. So I've heard of that inside a corporation, but not in eight, not in. Yeah, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of like angel or venture funds even do these sort of, sort of funding arrangements. Um, but I mean, yeah, maybe. I could see it working though. It, it would seem like it's less hassle. Um, but banks do that, don't they? Banks. Banks do that, don't they? Uh, I've seen that on construction. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. They, yeah, I don't like do anything in the construction law space, so I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't go anywhere near any construction. <laughs> I did have, this kind of relates to both of them. Um, 
So it goes to this issue of, let's say you're raising a million dollars, and let's say it's going to take you six months. The first guy to write the check, maybe at day one, is taking the most risk. And once you have, you know, 900000 in, the last guy to write a check is taking the less risk. Yeah. They have the same deal. Well, that's why everyone wants to be the last check. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so just be the last point, if, I, if I'm the first guy to write the check and I say, well, I don't want you to cash my check until the round is full. Yeah. And sort of how is that structured? So. Yeah. Well, you can clearly do that. You can tell the person, hey, you know, count me in, but... I'm not going to write the check. But if I don't up. say it, how? what's the default? And where does that show up in the documentation? What term would I look at? Yeah, so usually, um, usually the way I see it handled is sort of on an informal basis. People say, hey, I'm coming in, but you got to have 500000 with my money also. I don't want to come out with the money until you get 500000 coming in at the same time. So you schedule your first closing, and your first closing instructions to everybody are, hey, we're closing on five hundred thousand dollars. We've got five hundred thousand dollars commitments. Here's the paper. We, ex you know, appreciate very much. We close this all in the next few days. And you know, then I think that I mean, if, if you're comfortable, the CEO's not lying to you about having five hundred thousand dollars of commitments and it's all coming in. You know, then you can you feel comfortable going ahead. I mm -hmm. I think a lot of times what happens though is founders are trying to raise like a million dollars and they've got they're carrying around town a Series C term sheet. And we're trying to raise a million bucks. And what happens is they keep running into people who say, oh man, I'd write you a $25,000 check today if I could, but you can't have the first closing on a Series C financing for $25,000. Yeah, and, <laughs> and so then what we tell the founders is, oh, also have your pack back pocket the Cooper loan term sheet. You'd say, aha, well, I'll say you a note then. If you want to write a $25,000 check, I've got a note I can say right now. It'd be great. <laughs> and I think, too, <laughs> as I update the due diligence handbook and stuff, that's going to be something, the soft circling part of due diligence is going to be more transparent because that is, we, I mean, we are facilitators, we're an association, so anyone can put money in at any time that they want. But to protect the investors for the folks on due diligence, at least we have as a team lead who will soft circle the team members on the due diligence to see what their interest of investment is. That is, could be one form of protection in that whole. Yeah, yeah. You could do you, in the old days. People used to do escrows, but they're kind of pain in the ass. They cost a couple thousand bucks. So, so like practically could, speaking, what we used to tell companies is like, hey, get at least about five hundred thousand. If you're gonna raise a million, have at least half of that, and then do your first closing only when all those five hundred thousand in checks come in. You, you wouldn't want to like string along and take a hundred thousand. And this and applies to notes and equity, or just equity? Ju just in the preferred round. Just in the preferred. Yeah, and sometimes so companies, <laughs> companies also maybe back in the old days used to offer this idea of like, hey, we're not going to do an escrow, but we'll have a segregated account. And if you want to write your check, we'll put it in that segregated account. We won't tap that account until that account exceeds five hundred thousand. So it's like an informal, like, yeah, informal kind of trust escrow type. <clears throat> but the notes isn't it quite common that. If you raise that one million dollars, uh, the first the first five hundred get like thirty percent discount, and then for other twenty percent, that's even nothing. Like all depends. All depends. That's doable. Right? It's doable. Yeah, you can specify that. Yeah, the 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 but first. But will that be two notes then in the sort of segmentation? Or well, different ones or? I mean, for purposes of uh, note amendments. Uh, we, we would, as company council, would want to say that all the notes constitute the same group of notes, even yeah. if they have varying discounts, because we want to amend the notes for some reason, maybe extend a maturity day or something. We don't have a bunch of subclasses we need approvals from, because that can become pink. Of course, if you are an investor, you might prefer that each of those subclasses need to consent to an amendment. You might not like the amendment idea in general. <coughs> some people don't, but I think it's pretty common. To have an amendment. So that's one thing to say the Y Combinator company fixed and it's safes and it's old safes. <laughs> you, if you sold 30 safes, you want to amend them, you had to get 30 people to agree to amend. Yeah. And it's been historically the practice of convertible notes is you've seen a simple majority or maybe 60% of the holders of the notes to agree to amend, you can amend them all. But, yeah. What, 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 are, what are terms in the C level uh, uh, investments that? you see create the most friction 
avoid subsequent rounds of, um, that may you know, deter or, or be a negative for a, a, a VC able to come in? Oh, man, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, so what does the company do that kind of screws up its financing with venture funds? Um, takes too much money from too many people, has a cap table that's too big. Um, what else? <laughs> we have one now that's, uh, there were some notes that were sold at a really low cap, and the new <coughs> investors were like, hey, that's kind of not fair. They're getting kicked out like total bandits, so we're not gonna come in unless you get your earliest investors to amend it to have a higher cap. What? That's kind of crazy. That would be crazy. I, this is yeah. th that's super rare. This, that's just one. I've seen this a couple times. So people are like, but, "Oh, we, we're putting money in, but this we don't like the confusion about like, hey, the post money actually isn't like the post money because all these people put in a little bit of money and they're getting a discount, and it's kind of nonsense. That's kind of a nonsense negotiating technique, I think. If you were gonna say you're gonna put like five million bucks in, I think in like a Series A. What I've seen um, most sophisticated venture funds do is they say, hey, in exchange for our five million bucks, after our money comes in and after everything is converted, and after the option pool is increased, everything is done, we're gonna own 25%. So they don't proceed on a pre-money valuation basis. They just say, five million bucks, after everything comes in and converts, we own 25% of this company. And then you've got this math problem where you've got like, you've got to increase the plan, you've got to account for all the conversions of the debt, and then, so like back in the math. yeah, the, the math becomes. We thankfully we have like an Excel wizard on our team who can do this. But um, you know, that's the one way to do it, which keeps it pretty simple. Like I get twenty five percent for my five million bucks, and everyone else is just you know whatever. That, I don't but care. that's where the dilution comes in for the early stage investors. That really hits us hard. That makes it difficult. Yeah. So participation rights are really nice to have, right? Participation rights, so yes. you can like participate in future rounds. I mean, if you're lucky enough to get those in a unicorn company, I mean, maybe you won't be able to have the money to fulfill them, but you'll be able to syndicate it. So that's great. Is that the same as anti-dilution provisions? No, no. Anti-dilution means we sell preferred at a buck uh, to me, and then like six months later, the company sells preferred to Priyana for a quarter. I feel kind of ripped off. So I get an adjustment of my, I basically get an adjustment of my conversion ratio. So instead of my preferred converting into one share of common on conversion, it's going to convert into more than one share of common on conversion. You, so the participation rights, so that's um, a friend of mine says he always asks for it. Yeah, good idea. And he thinks it's, if a company ever pushes back, he would never invest. Is, it, I is there ever a reason for a company to push, push back? back? Yeah. You know, that's, I don't really think there's a good reason. <laughs> Usually companies are desperate to have yeah. their prior investors re-up when they're raising their money. open their checkbook, like, why would you not take it? Right, so I guess I, I guess maybe a company could, like, say your participation rights uh, weren't pro-rata rights, but they were, like, super pro-rata rights, or uh, they were the right to invest, like, like, hey, I want the right to invest $500,000 in your next round. Well, I mean, what if that does become a disproportionate amount of the new round? You can see how that might have set some sort of financing, but I think a straight pro rata participation rate is a really fair thing to ask for. And I'm not, I don't really see a good objection to yeah, it. Like he's saying, if I come in, I'm the first investor, and let's say I own 5% of the company, I want to be able to maintain yeah. that 5% <clears throat> yeah. all the way through. Yeah. You should get that. I think that's a fair ask. I mean, but that's so, not a standard part of the term, the, the, the term sheet or the, uh, the, the 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 notes we've signed. It's not. Today. You have to ask. You have to ask. You should ask. It's a side letter thing. It's a side letter. It's, yeah. it's a side letter, so it doesn't appear on the note itself. Usually not. Usually, Usually. it's a side letter thing. Maybe, could, maybe one thing we could do for you guys is, is just like TechStars publishes uh, their base convertible note document. I mean, we could prepare one for you guys that includes that. And every time. Sit down with you and yeah. Or we could drum out a good. Talk about that because I do have a sample template that I've yeah. talked to you about and, yeah. and drum out something yeah. that we can. Yeah, for sure. If we can provide, like, yeah, because we, we spend all day preparing legal documents. I mean, and so we, you know, if you need an example of one, like, we have really good side letters, like, not only ones we prepare, but we that really sophisticated investor. We can share all that stuff with you, a lot of people's names. We can prepare something for you guys for sure. Uh, it just a nomenclature question. Is it, is that called tag-along right? Well, tag-along right is, um, that, the idea there is more 
uh, say you invest in a company and then the founder, let's say she finds somebody who wants to buy all her stock for 10 million bucks, and she's like, great, I'll take it, and then you're just sitting there and you didn't get anything. Yeah. You got left behind, it was somebody else, who's now the you know, operator of the company, that's kind of shitty. And so usually in a Series A, you'll get a right of refusal on a co-sale agreement. Yes. Uh, and so that will say, that's a yeah. tag along the same thing as a co-sale, right? That's right. right. Okay. So that says, hey, if the founder gets offered to sell her, his or her shares, usually it's the investors have the right to buy them. If the investors pass, the investors have the right to go alongside the founder and selling their shares. <clears throat> you know, and the proportions are usually like, hey, this, we can, you know, this is an MDCA document you can look up online. And, and also linked to this, is it common that the leases can squeeze out the interest and sort of buy them out? Can they do that? Well, I mean, you need the consent of the angels to be bought out. Yeah. Um, the company is some Slack, for example. Slack did a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of uh, redemptions. redemptions, and uh, they had funding funding sources that offered to buy shares held by you know existing stockholders to kind of clean up the cap table. Yeah, because usually when at least a little bit later when private equity comes in, they want to clean the cap table, like when they buy yeah. the whole thing, right? So I guess yeah. it's also one of sometimes that clean. Cap Sometimes people are, are really like more than happy to say, hey, yeah, somebody's going to dump $25 million in the company and I'm going to have a chance to get some liquidity on my yeah. shares that have held for three or four years. Yeah. Great deal. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to. I, I think I have a lot of Uber I mean, along the way of you know, 10 years or so of, of investors going but what's really around? Would the investor's option not that it is? Yeah, it would be an election because you wouldn't, you wouldn't have otherwise signed a, a binding agreement um, to do that. But one thing that really um, that is kind of crappy about redemptions is say you bought qualified small business stock from a company, qualified small business stock is stock which you hold for more than five years and you sell, up to $10 million of the gain can be completely free of tax. So that's like roughly like $2.38 million <coughs> in federal tax. Because you, your capital gains rates 20%, you tack on a 3.8% for the uh, you know, Obamacare, or whatever you want to call it, you know, Medicare surtax thing. So that's $2.38 million. And man, we had a guy call us, and he had founded this company as an LLC, and like six months into his founding of this company, he had uh, had some ECs, they converted a corporation, took the money, sped off, and then, you know, four and a half years later, they sold the company. So if you just started as a corporation, you would have had us five years in, but you can't tap your LLC period to your corporate period. So I missed out. I heard of another guy, I heard of a guy who literally sold his company a, like a few days before he would have met the five day period, but no one mentioned it to him. <laughs> no one mentioned it to him. And it cost him you know, millions of dollars in taxes. <clears throat> so, but anyway, all things small business stock is great. But if companies do redemptions, it can disqualify all the previously, you know, the stock that were previously qualified for it. And that's what actually happened with Slack. They did a bunch of redemptions. And the redemption rules are really weird, and they don't really make a lot of sense. And if we ever have the chance to talk to somebody in Congress about fixing 1202, we've got to have them delete out the redemption provisions in it. Because I don't really understand the point of including those in the first place. Like, why would the, the company redeeming some shares affect your qualified small business stock that you bought in the company? I'm not sure the logic behind the public policy in that. And probably no one understands it was made up by somebody like 50 <coughs> years ago. It lingers around. I, so it'd be nice to strike out. The company buys, buys back shares, right? So under, under, under 1202, the qualified small business stock section, if the company redeems more than like 5% of the aggregate value of the shares during any like 12 or 20 point <coughs> period, then your qualified small business stock model qualifies. Our last academy was on uh, qualified small business yeah. stocks, and so for the Kretsu members, that video is up on Kretsu TV. So anyway, let's talk about this. This is probably the most interesting thing for you. So like, hey, if you're an investor, you know, what do you want? Like, what do you want to make sure you get, right? What do you want to make sure you don't inadvertently get? Um, and you know, obviously, one of the, I personally don't want to inadvertently find out I invested in a passive company and I'm going to get a K1. That would, that would suck. <clears throat> a lot of founders don't do a good job with uh, legal, and sometimes they don't even remember themselves what they did when they founded a company. Sometimes they went to a, a CPA, and the CPA filed an LLC certificate of formation, and then they filed an S corporation election, and then the founders don't remember. And then sometimes the, the founders are running around 
you know, telling you you're going to buy an LLC address and they have an LLC agreement with partnership tax provisions in it, and it's totally wrong because they're actually an S corp and they screwed it up. So anyway, I, I mean, I think you know, probably I don't know how often you see wacky things like that or you see all C corps come through here. Uh, we just did. Yeah, I mean, okay. we, we we're see some. Yeah, I mean, we typically the first question in Q and A is, when are you converting to a C corp? Right. Well, we do currently have a convertible note that is in negotiations with an LLC. Yeah. Yeah, and the wacky thing about that is that if you have an LLC taxless partnership, when it converts to a corporation, there can be a deemed tax event if the company has debt. Yeah, you have to you have to make sure that the right thing is filed. Right. Because it's, it's like right. it's a or something. So it's kind of a nightmare. There are actually a lot of like trick. There are a lot of traps like informing the LLC first, operating for a while, and then converting. And that's why I always tell people like, if you want to raise money, if you want to. If you do the traditional stock compensation equity type stuff, just don't waste your time and energy with an LLC because you'll literally waste a lot of time and money with an LLC. And then when you convert, you just throw all that paperwork away anyway. So you just waste, you just waste it. Like you could have done a civil corporate formation and spent a thousand bucks or something, but instead you spent a couple thousand on an LLC and you end up throwing it away. Then you have to confront all these weird, tricky issues on the conversions. It's kind of, it's just kind of a mess. It can be. And then you can cost yourself the qualified small business stock benefit too because it. The rules say when you convert a partnership into a corporation, uh, when you look at the uh, $50 million <coughs> test, usually the $50 million test just asks what is the adjusted basis in your assets? Gross, to, to, so, so to qualify for qualified small business stock, the company can have $50 million. Can have what, yeah, and usually it's the adjusted basis of assets that matter, but if you're converting, it's actually the fair market value of assets. And so you can blow your QSBS too. So I don't. I personally just said, don't, don't, don't waste time money on an LLC. You, you, you can't go try to raise money. Yeah. yeah, but if you're not involved with the company, you're a passive investor. It might be suspended. If the founders aren't putting in very much money, then what are the losses worth relative to the hassle? I mean, it's one thing if you're going to dump a couple million. Like I had some Microsoft guys once. They were each going to dump in like a million bucks, and they're going to hire a bunch of people to code away. And that was back when the qualified small business stock benefit was only a 50% tax break. And it used to be only a 50% tax break on the 28% rate. So you only got down to 14. And then the, that 50% break was an AMT adjustment. So the whole, and the, and the capital gains tax rate was 15%. So you're only saving like a fraction of a percent. So it didn't really matter. But now it's 100%. It's an AMT exclusion as well. It's, it's more significant. You really, I, you know, if you're just putting in a few thousand bucks, you're going to bridge to a company. Pass through the losses just aren't going to add up to very much, okay. especially compared to like the potential future benefit of the qualified small business stock thing. I mean, that could be a lot of money. Granted, it's speculative, but you'd hate to like have missed it out because you wanted a couple thousand dollars in deductions on your through an S corp or something. That'd be a that'd be a really good number. Um, but in any event, I mean, I think what you guys should think about is you know, make sure you get participation rights. We talked about that. Maybe a most favored nations clause. We are investing in a convertible equity instrument or a convertible note, information rights, and the other random various what are things we talk about. Can you rights? talk a little bit more about information rights, please? Sure, so this is just the right to receive the financial statements of the company quarterly. So don't, so, but if, they, but if they take capital from you, isn't there a fiduciary duty <coughs> that the company has to provide you that information, or does it have to be in writing? Well, under the, so say you form a Delaware Corporation, and say I, I sell you some shares, it's great. Um, and then, yeah, let's say you you and I, we have a TIF or something, you don't want to call me back, or I don't want to call you back, and then you're mad, and you want the information. Well, under Delaware law, you can't just demand information and get it. You have to have a proper purpose for the demand, and the information requested has to relate to the proper purpose. Mm -hmm. So you can get kind of screwed, and I've seen investors kind of get screwed by company counsel just kind of yanking them around. My philosophy is company counsel is, hey man, the investor wants some information, okay, maybe you haven't signed an NDA if they haven't signed one, but don't hide shit, because yeah. if you hide anything, then you're stealing from them. Give them what they want, as long as for the reason they sign a confidentiality. Don't be, don't be a high behavior person, That's, no one likes that. It just makes everyone really angry, and people just get fired up about that. I've seen investors get really pissed off, like, why won't that founder give me that information? You know, that's, that's bogus. But you do see that sometimes. So, not always. They answer questions. Not always. And that's a good thing. I think that you stressed was later it, after you've invested initially, because in due diligence, 
we usually see all of the finance, right. we see everything. Right. And, well, typically, sometimes it plays in the VA, and that's up to the investor to sign. Right. But it's after the fact. And I, I mean, my dad is a part of this community, which is why I know some of it. But yeah. it's, if you don't, if you lose contact for a little while, right. you don't hear from them, right. and then you want to ask for it, they have to give it to you. If you have the right suit. Right. Do, do note holders have, are they in a different control world? They don't typically, typically the information rights are not included in the note. I mean, I think it's good corporate practice to share whatever information is requested. But I mean, sometimes you'll wind up with somebody who's also invested in a competitor company. And the founder's like, oh, that person invested in my competitor. Why do they want my financial statements? Screw that person. You know, sometimes. I mean, not always, but sometimes. So, information rights. I, you know, information rights are nice. Uh, the rights to inspect sometimes come with information rights. The rights to sit down with management and ask questions. So inspection rights would be like a sub-clause at the end of the day, like, if you give us the information and we find, we have the right to. Usually the inspection rights are a little more broadly, uh, a little more broadly written than that, so it's not, you fail to product the information, it's like, no, I'd like to come to your business and, and yeah, and the NBCA um, <coughs> documents are pretty good inspection rights language. You're looking for some, or we can send you some information and stuff. Yeah. But then, if the company goes on and raises like a series E from SoftBank and like becomes, you know, Uber or Slack, you're probably going to lose those information, right? As an angel, right? Yes. Maybe it depends on how, where your rights are encompassed or where they're embodied. I mean, if they're embodied in a side letter, one of the benefits of a side letter is it's a contract between you and the company, yeah. and there's usually no other party, which means if you want, if the company wants to amend that agreement, they've got to get your consent to amend it. Whereas if your information rights are embodied in, in like an investor rights agreement, that agreement is amendable by majority of, of, the, of, the, of the parties to that agreement and the company. And so frequently, yeah, frequently if there's a major investor definition and only major investors get participation rights yeah. in, in information rights sometimes. And so your rights can be narrowed down, taken away in subsequent rounds unless they're embodied in a place which says, no, you can't take this away from us without consent. Yeah, anyway, the short story is we do this for a living, we really like it. We really have a good time. So, I mean, you shouldn't hesitate just ping us with random questions because we love that. So, That's another cool. random question. Yeah. We've already invested in this stuff and we have a secured uh, side letter. In general, would you as counsel go back to the company and say you should not sign any side letters for, <coughs> for, for term sheets that have already been signed? You mean you've already, already invested? You've already, you're already invested. invested, right? You would generally say, ah, yeah, you. There's no reason for you to ever do this, right? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, if, you, if, if we were sitting in a company and you put some money into a note and you came back and said, hey, I'd yeah. really like to have these rights, we, I, we'd probably counsel the founder to give it a look. Why not? Okay. I mean, shoot friendly to your investors for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just information. It's just information. information. Well, I'm just saying with all this stuff. It gives the company. Uh, yeah, it gives the company. Like the MFN is the big one, I would think, that mm -hmm. someone would agree to that after you've actually already invested. Yeah, and on that note, on that note, like if you're selling a note, let's say, I'm sorry, I'm talking. It's okay. Uh, but like if you sold a note with like a million dollar cap, okay, and then like six months later you sold a note with like a half a million dollar cap, I think you have a fiduciary responsibility to give that, to give that deal, with, even without an MFN. I think you've got to give that deal to your prior investor. You can't take advantage of your prior investor if you make the term sweeter for somebody who comes along later. I think you've got to make it up to them. That's what I tell companies. I don't think you can. Yeah, absolutely like that. Yeah. Joe, you've been doing this a long time, and both of you guys really appreciate you doing this for us. Yeah. You, you made a list of a lot of mistakes that angel investors could do, but in practice, what are the top two or three that you've seen over the years that angel investors have done, made mistakes that caused them pain and, and money? Yeah, let me ponder that while what were you going to ask us, Jessica? Uh, I was just going to ask if you had a book recommendation for, like, kind of the soup to nuts, this whole board, your deck, all in one, but gives more information, deeper understanding of things like valuation cap or, yeah. you know, how that gets, you know, just basically the textbook. What yeah. would it be? Yeah, okay, well, so I've written one, but it's not published yet. I could probably send you the draft. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, been, it's, it's been at the 98 yard line, I feel like. Okay. The more and, anyway, and then there's the Brad Feldman book. The Brad Feldman book is great. Okay. How to do, I think that book's called How to Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Your Venture Capitalist or something okay. like that. Didn't Cal Canis write one too? Mm, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. 
But getting back to your thing, what are the three biggest mistakes? I mean, um, what would can you think of any right now? Investing in a note without a cap, maybe. Yeah, that one's easy. That one's easy. Uh, that one you know. <laughs> I would say one mistake that we recently saw was investing in a note where this upon sale of the company, the return was just your initial what you put in and your interest. Yeah, that'd be crazy. If the, if the that, note that had not converted, the if death the note penalty, like, mm -hmm. the problem there. Yep, and it was like a four-year or five-year yeah. rate. Oops. Wouldn't that be terrible if you invested a company and it got to an exit and you were stoked and then you found out that there's a really great, or speaking of mistakes, there's a really great article <coughs> called that. Um, you can Google and find it. It was called How I Lost My First Billion Dollars. <laughs> and it was about this guy. He'd, he'd made some money and he took some time off and screwed around or whatever and then decided he needed something to do. And so he decided he'd become an angel investor. But he decided he would do it in a different way. He decided he, what he would do is he would walk around, walk around, and he would perceive problems that he thought someone should build a solution for. And then he would get on angel list and he'd try to find people who were working on that problem. So he discovers the Airbnb before anyone else does. And he calls them on the blue and says, hey, you're working in the hospitality, social hospitality space. I'm really curious about this space. I'd love to come talk to you about it. And so he meets the founders and they start dickering about terms. And he's got a group of people behind him who are going to invest with him. And they're all going to put in half million bucks and aggregate together to Airbnb. And then the way the story goes is, and Airbnb wasn't the first company like this. I mean, there was the VRBO before them, and they were a house away. There were some other companies before them who were doing better. Anyway, Airbnb's numbers miss, like their projections are wrong, and they miss, and like, this guy's co-investors all back out. But he still wanted to put in a half million bucks himself. He has to. And so they spend like two or three weeks dickering about the pre-money valuation and the valuation of which the money is going to come in. He wants like a $4 million valuation. They want like a four and a half million dollar valuation, whatever. So they spend like three weeks dickering over this. They still want like 4.2 million bucks. Then they call the lawyers, they get the lawyers involved. Well. The lawyers, you know, spend a few weeks going back and forth on in hindsight it looks like stupid stuff. And then on the closing day, he uh, he calls and because he hasn't heard from the guy, it's like eleven o'clock in the morning, he calls and it's like, Hey, we closing it, I've got my money ready, I'm excited to close, you know, I'm really excited to close this deal, I'll be closed. And the founder says, Well, I've got good news and bad news. And the investor says, well, What's the bad news? And the the founder says, Well, we found a new investor. And the guy says, like, that's great, you know, because all my guys backed out. It's great. It's great we have more investors. That's wonderful. Who is it? And the founder says, it's Y Combinator. And he's like, well, that's wonderful. Well, they're a wonderful investor. What's the bad news? And the founder says, well, Y Combinator is the only one coming in. I'm not going to take your money. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. And of course, it's easy in hindsight to see, right? And tied the time with it. Probably that goes a little bit with, uh, with your comment, right, about being the first one. Sometimes you just need to lean, lean in, which otherwise you might lose out if it's really attractive. I've, I've done that twice on principal companies where I sort of waited too long. Yeah. Yeah. It's or crazy else, to be maybe what I was saying is there a way you can write your check and I give you my check, okay, but don't cash it you can say that. until the round is full. You can say yeah. that. It would require trust. You could write a letter to the founder saying, I'm closing my check, I'm my subscription document, or anything else, but I don't authorize you to cash a check. And, I mean, and I'm not going to be bound to this investment if you don't raise this amount of money by a certain time. Right. But if you do, just email me and tell me, and I'll say, please cash the check, and I want to, I want to be in the deal, but I want to make sure other money's in too. And it would require trust, because the guy could still, you know. He could cash it. He could cash it, but then you have that letter, and I think, you know, generally speaking, if someone did that, they pretty much ruin their name in the community as a whole. And you could sue them. And that kind of stuff, but or you could you know you could require an escrow of some kind if you wanted to. It's just that they cost you know they cost money. Do you have a conditional capital commitment? You could subscribe and agree to put the money in as soon as you hit the milestones. Sure. I mean sometimes that's thrown in the term sheet. It's like hey we won't do our first closing until we raise the first five hundred thousand or something, um, and you guys can negotiate that in. Uh, and then it, to your question on mistakes investors make. I mean, well, I don't know if this is a mistake, but it's something we haven't talked about yet. It's like, understand what the protective provisions are in a preferred stock financing, which are basically veto rights given to the group of um, Series A or Series C investors to approve certain kind of major uh, actions by the company. So sometimes that is approving the next financing round or approving like a sale or merger of the company, uh, things like that. It gives you guys a little more control.
control, especially if you don't have a board seat, um, to to guide the company along. Yeah, I heard VC recently say, yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't, in, we don't, um, we don't, we appear not to invest for control because we're only buying in minority state, but we do actually invest for control. Still <laughs> 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 contractually. Yeah. So I have a question about uh, convertible notes. Just in uh, recent years here in, in the Seattle area, what's the upper limit on the amount that somebody has raised on a convertible note? Hmm. Man, I have losing companies raised like $5 million in notes, successive rounds, and they run up like $5 million outstanding. Five, yeah. five million? Or? Yeah, I mean, maybe even a little bit more than that. Sometimes we do a bridge round. I mean, especially if the company's going from, say, their Series A, Merging onto a series of true bridge round. Yeah, like maybe they're what's had a company they had a fifty million dollar series B, but before that they sold some notes to tide them over between A. So you know maybe it'll raise five million on that, but it's kind of like it's it's almost in conjunction with the series B, but that there's so much negotiation that it takes to raise fifty million bucks that you're like, hey, just give me a quick injection, like five. So. All right. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you all for coming. This is a great discussion. Thank you so much.